So, brethren, we come to the word of God. <clears throat> there are three very clear means of grace that God has given us to worship him in Scripture. That is prayer, singing, and the reading and preaching of his word. That we find those in the scripture. Much of what goes on in churches today has no biblical basis, which is one of the reasons the churches are so sick. We need the reviving power of God's spirit to blow across this nation. Brethren, I hope you are on your knees, if not daily, weekly, crying out to God for the power of God's spirit. There is no Christianity without his power moving in his people. I can say it this simply. The Holy Spirit is the Christian life. <clears throat> we will never obey. We will never repent. We will never look to our God in the faith that we should except the Spirit of God be working in our souls. Uh -uh. I can study, I can fast, I can pray, I can put together the best sermon that I can, and you will be cold as a stone and unhearing as a deaf man if you've not prepared your heart to come and hear Christ's word. And you'll think it's just that preacher. <laughs> now, I've got faults, and sometimes... I am the problem in my preaching. But apart from that, <clears throat> you should be praying always for whoever's going to stand in this pulpit and bring you the word of God. Praying earnestly, O oh Christ, we can do nothing without your spirit. Blow with those mighty winds. You go back and read the, uh, the diaries and the journals of the, the, the great men and pastors of uh, in the history of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will see them pleading with God always for his power and his presence among his people. If you're not doing that, stop whatever else you're doing and make sure you're doing that. <clears throat> Our country is sick to death. I don't know if you're hearing the death rattle but it's rattling really loud. We have been put here to be salt and light. Our lives should testify that Jesus Christ is real, that he saves sinners and fools and rebels and makes them citizens of his kingdom. Amen. We should be clearly distinguishable from the world. So may God help us. That will not come apart from tears before God, crying to him for his power and presence when his people meet. So I urge every one of us to take this seriously. <clears throat> that being the case, we're going to open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to read verses 5 through 9 again. This most precious and sometimes this most mysterious and challenging book is food for the soul. Sometimes we have to dig deeply. <clears throat> very deeply to begin to realize what is actually being argued. And this is a glorious passage. Not that there are any weak ones in it, but I trust that as we are here in these verses, our hearts and minds will be drawn to see something of the beauty of Christ in ways that we have not seen. It is my hope um, Next Lord's Day, because we're coming into the issue of the incarnation, 
to uh, take something of what is called an excursus. That's a, an, a, an extra addition to explain difficult items. And I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on the notion of the God-man. What do we mean by the incarnation? How do we really understand it? It took hundreds of years for the church of Jesus Christ to come to settled position on what the scripture actually taught about the Trinity and the uh, incarnation of Christ. I've mentioned that before, and I will mention that regularly. <clears throat> Our God is not Santa Claus. Our God is not someone who just pats us on the head and hopes we do better. He is the almighty sovereign who created this world by his word, this universe. He sustains it. He can evaporate it with one word. We need to know that God. <clears throat> Not the, the great psychologist in the sky. We need the mighty creator and savior. And we'll see something of him in this glorious passage. <clears throat> that being said, if you would stand with me one more time, we're going to read verses 5 through 9. I read uh, all of it last week. Uh, today we will only read 5 through 9. <clears throat> what a privilege. You are holding the word of God. Now may we hear it and hold it in our hearts. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, verse 5, the living word of God. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor and did set him over the work of thy, the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things. Now listen carefully. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Now, that very sentence should grip you. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Please remain standing for prayer. O oh, blessed God, almighty, sovereign, creator and redeemer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have sung of Thee, we have sung to Thee and to one another. Oh, and how I pray that it has been with grace in our hearts. Lord, lift up the downcast, encourage and build up Thy church this morning. Fill Thy living stones with the power of Thy Spirit, and may we exalt Thee, save the lost, Encourage, bless, and sanctify the saved. May it all be to the everlasting glory of thy name and of thy kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The pastor and author of this sermon 
has revealed the radiant splendor of God's crucified, resurrected, ascended, and enthroned Son as he sits exalted at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Our imaginations, no matter how great our faith, our imaginations are stretched past their limits as we try to take in Christ's regal beauty, his astounding glory in the regions of eternity. By the command of God, every citizen of heaven worships, serves, adores, and exalts the God-man. Every regenerate heart on earth longs for, communes with, and waits for the God-man. And his present exaltation is but preparation, preparation for the magnificence of the world to come. Now, having guided the author to begin this letter with Christ's enthronement, in other words, he starts at the end of the story, almost. The Holy Spirit now directs the author to give his readers a flashback to Christ's humiliation. The letter starts with Christ at the Father's right hand. And at this point, we descend to his incarnation and humiliation. Why? Well, I hope we will see that. And I hope that we will love him more because of that. Having revealed scenes of grandeur from Christ's exaltation, the Spirit now takes us back in time. Takes us back in time to the incarnation. Christ, glorious incarnation. The eternal Son of God uniting with humanity. Therefore, the title of this message is From Exaltation to Incarnation, Part 2. May our Heavenly Father open our understanding and strengthen our faith by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit as we gaze upon God's purpose for Christ's incarnation. It's elaborated to the end of the chapter but we can see it as we get to verse 9. Now, last time we began with this heading, the world to come will not be ruled by angels. I repeat, the world to come, the splendor, the dazzling glory of the world to come will not be ruled by angels. Powerful, knowledgeable, as those creatures are, they will not be the rulers of that splendid world. Verse 5 declares, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Now, once again, the Holy Spirit reveals the angels' lesser revelation. God's law compared to Christ's greater new covenant revelation is amazing. Let me say that again. God puts for us here, for our edification, for our understanding, that the angels are not going to rule the world to come. And then he tells us that they're Revelation is a lesser revelation. It's a revelation from God. It's vital 
It's important. We should know it. But in the light of the new covenant revelation in Christ Jesus the Lord, it pales in comparison. It's like the sun at moon day compared to the moon at night. Or maybe better still, a raging million acre forest fire to a lit match. They're both fire. But the revelation of Jesus Christ is all glorious. You are living in the day of the greatest revelation from God ever. And our lives ought to show that. How we think, how we speak, how we act, how we treat Christ's church should say we have the most astonishing revelation of God's grace ever. While the angels played a significant role in delivering God's law, their revelation shrinks in comparison to the witness of Christ the Son, His apostles, and His heavenly Father, who confirmed their message by signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, we see the angels' lesser glory Next, when compared to Christ's rule, the angels will not rule the world to come. Now, that led us to consider at some length the regal splendor of the new heavens and the new earth, which are prophesied in the Old and New Covenant Scriptures. We're living in the age of, in which the new world has begun. It starts with the new birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Christ came and inaugurated the kingdom of heaven. It didn't look like he won. It looks like he lost on the cross. But it was there that he crushed the serpent's head. And he put the death blow to Satan's kingdom. That's one of the reasons the kingdom of darkness is working so hard out there. Satan knows his days are short. We are citizens of the kingdom of life, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of light. We should be living that way. It's a serious contrast. If you're faithful to God's word, you don't have to go looking for a fight, an argument, or people to despise you. Just live faithfully for Christ, and it will happen sooner or later. It might be your own family. My friends, the heart of every blood-bought, spirit-transformed soul should sing with joy and thanksgiving in anticipation of the arrival of the world to come. Think of it. Eternal rule with Christ the Son. Christ the lover of our souls, Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's coming. If then the angels will not govern that world to come, then by whom? That brings us to our first thought today. The world to come will be ruled by Christ, the Son, and His people. The world to come will be ruled by Christ, the Son, and His people. Verses 6 through 9. 
Those verses now reveal Christ's superior rule by introducing Christ's incarnation. As we will see later in the book, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the go-between. He comes between the holy, awesome God and weak, pathetic, guilty sinners. How can those two come together? Holiness and sinfulness do not work together. If a lost man went to heaven, he would hate it. He would despise it. He hates purity here. He would hate purity there. Christ is going to rule. And this is all connected to his incarnation. Well, that will truly be our, our theme today and God willing next week as well. So in, in other words, the Holy Spirit readjusts our focus. Now, what do I mean by that? Chapter 1 emphasized Christ's deity. Chapter 2 now emphasizes Christ's humanity. This is the incarnation. It is a miracle beyond our comprehension. A true, glorious deity. The Son unites with flesh creation. The Creator unites with creation. Why? He's the go-between. As true deity, he can lay hold of God the Father. And as true man, he can lay hold of us. That's our mediator. It's vital that he be God and man. He's true God True man in one person. We'll talk about some, just a few, of the intricacies and the difficulties of what I've just said. It's plainly laid out in our confession. I urge you, if you haven't read chapter 8 in the confession in a while, sit down and meditate on it. If you want to see your Savior in a short compass that's the best short treatment of Christ I have personally ever read. So, chapter 1 emphasized his deity. Chapter 2 emphasizes his humanity. The Holy Spirit now calibrates our thinking differently. I mentioned in the introduction sermons or the introductory sermons to this book, I said that there's a constant going back between heaven and earth when we're in that moment right now. The glories of Christ we see in chapter 1, let all the angels of God worship Him. Splendor, eternity, regions of glory. And then, the incarnation. We go from heaven down to earth. And we see the magnificent, the most holy son of God in some extraordinary way united with manhood. Now, how's the Holy Spirit going to make this calibration? How, how is he going to adjust our thinking right now? <clears throat> he does so by means of a flashback. Most of us know, I think, that a flashback is an effective way of telling a story. Whether in literature, film, 
television, or any other means of storytelling. What purpose does a flashback serve? Well, it takes the reader or it takes the viewer out of the present storyline. Takes us out <clears throat> to a past event in a character's life. We're in a present story, but the author picks us up and takes us back and says, wait a minute, now look at this. The purpose is to give the reader or the viewer more detail and better understanding of what's happening in the present storyline. We see something in the past that's affected what's going on now. That's exactly what the author's doing here. He starts in splendor, magnificence, glory, angels worshiping Jesus. And then he takes us down to the humiliation of the eternal Son of God as he lives in this world, this sinful world. This cesspool of mankind morally. He wants us to understand better that Christ sitting on the throne. So, we have more detail. We have better understanding for the main storyline story in chapter 2. It's going to give us a richer understanding of the remarkable things said about Christ in the first chapter. So the author employs a flashback using Psalm 8, which is a, uh, an allusion. You may have flashback uh, in that word. It should be an allusion. He employs a flashback using Psalm 8, which is an allusion, A-L-L, -L, not illusion, I-L. An allusion to Genesis 1 through 3. The first we must consider the author's reliance upon Scripture. It's essential to the argument. He's going to make his argument. I don't mean a fist-swinging, red-faced argument. He's going to make a theological argument. He's going to try to persuade. So listen carefully. The text says, but one, in verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man, that thou art mindful of him? The holy author of this letter now does what all faithful pastors and teachers must do. He starts with Scripture, reasons from Scripture, and feeds Christ's sheep with Scripture. Such thinking is rooted in Jesus, our model, Jesus, our prophet. The words that I speak unto you, said our Savior. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They're not just any old words coming out of any old human mouth. When Jesus spoke, it was under the direction of his Father, by the Holy Spirit without measure, and men were hearing Revelation directly from God. That's what pastors and teachers, fathers and mothers, should do. They should speak the words of God to their children. Well, <clears throat> For that reason, Christ, speaking these words of life, Paul and the other apostles continuously spoke 
the words of life. Consider Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. Paul, it says, as his manner was, this was his custom. He was in a rut, and it was a good one. He went in unto them, that's the Jews in the synagogue, and three Sabbath days, listen carefully, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Reasoned with them. His mind filled with the word, his heart filled with the Holy Spirit, took the words of God and explained them to his fellow Jews. This is how the Holy Spirit describes it. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. That is what we see here in Hebrews. Peter's words to the elders among his readers Feed the flock of God which is among you. That means feeding Christ's people the word of God, which includes explaining, demonstrating, and persuading from Scripture. Let me say that again. That includes, if, if anyone is going to stand in this pulpit and quote, feed the sheep, it's going to have to be from taking the Word of God, explaining it, then demonstrating it. What does it mean? How does it apply to you and to me? And persuading from the Scriptures, as I've said before, and I will say it again. The Scriptures demand response. The words of God demand that your mind, my mind, hear what's being said and reply to it with our lives. If you're just reading the Bible, getting a couple of facts here and there, and then just moving on, has nothing to do with you, doesn't change anything about your day, doesn't change anything about your relationship with your wife and your friends, with your church, fellow church members, why are you reading it? What good is it doing you? God's word demands a reply. Now, <clears throat> that's what Paul was doing. He was setting it before them. He was arguing. That's what Peter was doing. Even on any given Lord's Day, when a pastor... Uh, uh, an appointed preacher stands in the pulpit. He is to take God's word. He is to set God's word before God's people with an expected response. Not, oh, I'm going to grade the sermon today. It was about a five. I didn't really get it. I just didn't really. Well, I, he said some of that stuff before. But don't be like the Athenians that have to have something new every time somebody opens her mouth. This is the revelation. This is why we're commanded to give more earnest heed to what we have heard. Why? To live it. This man, writing Hebrews, is pleading with his fellow Jews not to leave the faith. So he's explaining he is not only explaining, he's demonstrating. Look at this. Look at this and think about this. And then he's persuading. Don't leave the faith. Don't leave faith in Jesus Christ. Especially when times get hard. Especially when times get hard. 
the Apostle Paul said to the elders of Ephesus, feed the church of God. That's what the Holy Spirit called you to do. Sometimes it's all encouragement, sweet, pure gospel honey. Sometimes it's from a father warning us and saying, are you listening? Your well-being for the future depends on whether you're listening, believing, and applying it to your life. What does, it, what does it mean to feed the church of God but to explain, demonstrate, and persuade? Here's what the Word of God says. Do you understand? This is what He's getting at. And now, are you going to live this? God expects you to live that. Oh, wait a minute. We've gone from grace to law. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. How do we show love to the living Christ? It is just said. We do what he says. I mean, if your children disobeyed you all day, every day, but ended every day with, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Mommy. Uh, it would sound a little hollow, wouldn't it? Love Christ back. Walk with him. It's worth everything that it costs you to walk with him. The, the, the pastor in Hebrews is pressing us to that notion. Don't leave the faith. Walk with Christ, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. Paul wrote to Timothy, I charge thee, therefore, before God. This is one of the strongest charges in the New Testament, in my opinion. He says to his younger brother, I charge thee. I'm giving you a responsibility and I'm expecting you to do this. Therefore, I charge thee before God. It's as though he, he grabs Timothy by the robe and pulls him before the throne of God. And says, I'm charging you in his presence and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach my truths. Tell them. Explain them. Explain them. Demonstrate it. Prove it. And persuade, walk this way. Honor Christ this way. He's worthy. He's made you alive in the Spirit. He's given you His Spirit. He's given you His Spirit-breathed Word. He's given you His Spirit-filled congregation to walk on the way with you toward the city of glory. Walk with Christ, whatever the cost. It is amazing how Paul speaks of preaching the word here. Be instant, in season, out of season. When it's convenient, when it's not convenient. When people, you know people aren't going to like what you have to say. You be a watchman on a wall because the blood of their lives is your responsibility. And so he says, reprove, first word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, that's not all there is to, to preaching, but it's quite interesting that that's exactly what Paul brings up here. It's because the people in Ephesus were facing false doctrine. They were embracing it here and there. 
And Paul says to Timothy, get in there and take the false doctrine by the horns. Go head to head with it, toe to toe. Take the sword of the Spirit and do damage to the lies the people are believing. We can add to Paul's list as far as preaching goes. We can add to this, to this words like, and comfort. Paul comforted the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Read it. And he tells them about the God of all comfort. Edify. We're commanded to edify. The word edify means to build. To build people up. There's some things that have to be torn down, shredded, stamped on like the gold idol that Moses took, stamped on, and then made everybody drink that, that powdered gold, drink it. Do we get the, the idea of what that means? What goes in must come out. He took their false god and made them drink it. So that it would be evacuated from the body. That's a powerful picture. Brethren, we don't like our idols to be stamped on. We generally would like for them to be nursed a little bit. We want to feel better about our idols. It is not the watchman's place to ever let you be nuzzled up to that which will destroy you. Your best life now. Well, if you follow Christ faithfully, you may have a life of persecution, people hating you, despising you. But the end is glory because you have Christ. If Christ means nothing to you, you will be easily drawn away when the fires of persecution come. So the author is doing exactly what Christ did and what the apostles were commanded to do and what every pastor should be doing. Taking the word of God, giving it to God's people, explaining it to God's people, demonstrating the truths of it, not only talking about them, but living it. And finally, persuading, don't do this. I have sat with people who have veered off the path. And I'm not much of one for pleading. But there have been times when I have said, please, don't go this way. And then you watch their ship go out from the dock and it's not too long before there's a crash against the reefs of their sin. This is what the author of Hebrews is doing. Don't do this! This is not a book that you sit, you know, and just kind of go, oh, I'll just sit down and read it and yeah, it's kind of nice. Not sure what that means here or there, but let's move on. This is a man whose heart, his blood pressure is probably pretty high at the moment. And he's pleading with these people who have professed to be Christ. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. Stay in God's word. Because you're heading for a crash. You are heading for a fall. You're going to walk away from Christ to save your neck but you may lose your soul. He's doing what every pastor should do. We encourage, we love, and we warn. So the author of Hebrews here, we, we can 
we can say he wants to encourage, he wants to edify, he wants to support, he wants to sympathize, but he's also got to reprove and rebuke. That's love. You can't look at somebody about to walk off a cliff and just sit there and say, well, you know, I don't want to mess with his liberty. To leave somebody in their sin is a terrible thing. Now, if we've warned them and they're going to do what they're going to do anyway, well, at that point, we have to let them go. But it's always tragic to see them disappear off a cliff. So, the author of Hebrews now continues to explain, to demonstrate, to persuade his readers that Christ is superior to the angels, especially in his rule. He argues uh, uh, that Christ and his people will govern the world to come. Now, he hasn't reached it yet. He's building up to it, but that's where he's going. It's not going to be the angels. And then he kind of puts us waiting, puts a little tension on us. He just goes back into Psalm 8 and he starts explaining some things. And it's like, oh, wait, where's this going? Well, we'll get there, God willing. So let us watch carefully how the author relies on Scripture. Following the same method that he used in chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. He made very clear statements. He explained. He demonstrated that Christ was God. And then he persuades. That's why he turns and gives a warning. That's what that warning sitting there between chapter 1 and chapter 2 is all about. His love for his hearers. Now listen more carefully to the words of God, more intensely. So then, this is where we move to prove his point. He, can try, he attempts to convince his hearers by moving from Christ's exaltation to Christ's incarnation. That brings us to the author's argument from Holy Scripture, verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> Our text says, but one in a certain place testified, saying. Now, when it says a certain place, it doesn't mean a geographical location. It means a place in the Bible. There's a certain place in the Bible. Some of you, if you read books of theology, you will eventually come uh, across the, the Latin word locus. L-O-C-U-S, or loci, L-O-C-I, uh, singular and plural. And what it means is places, places in Scripture that say this or that, that develop this theme or that one. You often find that in systematic theology. They will talk about the locus of this particular issue begins in this passage. It's the place. Bible places, Bible addresses. So what did the one in a certain place testify? What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him man. A little lower than the angels, thou crownest him, man, with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now... Here comes the, the mysterious sentence. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Well, everything's been put under him, but we don't see it. It actually makes much sense if you know something about the scriptures. 
That is a quote, a direct quote from Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. In that psalm, King David, this is very important, it's King David as the attributed author of that psalm. He's sitting, he begins, he begins that, uh, that wonderful psalm by saying, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And there are two different words for Lord there. There is the first one, which is Yahweh, or some would, the, the minority, there are some that argue it should be Yehovah, from which we get our English, Jehovah. That's God's covenant name. So when it says the covenant name of God, David is saying, you whom I serve in your covenant, you called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You made me king over Saul, my covenant God. I walk with you in your law, with your commandments, with your testimonies, with your precepts. I love your law. Oh, how love I thy law, that David. And he says, oh, Lord, our Adonai. Adonai is another word translated Lord, but you'll see the covenant name is in small caps. The next Lord, same four letters, are in regular first, first letter capital, and the other three letters are small case. O covenant God, our sovereign. That's what it means. He's meditating and praising his glorious, almighty creator and covenant God, the one who set his, uh, David's, uh, 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 all of the descendants of, of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the father of the nation, Abraham. And all of those descendants, David's a part of that. He's a part of that. That's why he can say, you're our covenant God. Moses gave them the law. The Sinai covenant was sealed out at, out at the mountain. David eventually became the king of the, those people. And he's sitting and thinking about the greatness of, their, of his God. Now, we ought to do that. We ought to do that. How great. Oh, Yahweh, oh, Yehovah, our sovereign, our Lord. How excellent, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. This is worship. We're hearing worship. Here's a man thinking about his God and it's bringing him to worship. That's the way it all work with us. Amen. We need to sit down and think about our God, about our Christ. Oh, Christ, who shed his blood and brought me by the power of his spirit into his new covenant. Amen. Think of your covenant God. And think of that blessed covenant sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ and worship. Worship. Think on him. Watch what David's doing. And, and when he thinks about how great and glorious his God is, then he asks the question, what is man? What is man compared to you? And our answer, obvious, obviously, is nothing. What are we compared to God? If we think about who God is, what he's done. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He split the darkness, set lights, created in six days, and all of it was good. Wasn't a single mistake. How many of you started on a project, and you were fully intending to do a wonderful job on it, and along the way, well, you made some serious errors, or at least an error. It's not a perfect 
project. No such thing with God. Everything he said, everything he did, he brought into existence. The, the, the millions of stars, the glory of the sun, the, the moon, the creatures that he made, the depths of the sea, the heights of the mountain. He spoke it into existence. What are we? How many of you have been able to go into your room, get away from everybody, sit down, and with everything in you, do all that you can to create a single-celled creature? Ever tried that? God spoke and everything came into existence. We can't change what's happening at work sometimes. Right? We can't change a bad habit that we have. And we're struggling and wrestling with all of that. What is man in comparison to you, O oh great and mighty God? Now he goes on to, as he thinks about it, remember, David is not only a product of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not only a product of the Mosaic covenant. He's living under Moses' law and Moses' covenant with the people and with God. God came to him and said, I'm going to keep your family line on my throne. I'm going to call your sons my sons. The Davidic king were the lines through which the ultimate king came, Jesus Christ. The covenanted man says, what are we? Why would you visit us? That's humility. That's knowing something about God and something about yourself. When we don't see the glory and the bigness of God, people become too big. So, he says, <clears throat> why would you visit us? Thou hast made him man, mankind, a little lower than the angels. We're not as powerful as they are. But thou crownest him, man, with glory and honor. And did set, over him, the, uh, set him over the works of thy hands. Don't let that get by you in the beauty of the language. God says, you're going to rule over this. What I've made, you're going to rule it. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That's, a, that's the quote from Psalm 8. And as we learned from several passages in chapter 1, there is both a historical understanding of this psalm. David was a real man sitting and thinking about real historical things. But there's also a Christological understanding. None of David's sons were ever the kings God commanded them to be. There were some that were better than the others. What's the Christological aspect? Jesus is the son of David. And he is the king that Hebrews tells us is now seated on the throne in his glory. Why would you visit man? What is man? He's the co-heir with God. He's going to rule this world. And that all comes from the fact that Jesus Christ was the perfect son. He was the perfect son and became the perfect king. He has accomplished everything that man should have and didn't. So, 
Psalm 8, interestingly, makes allusion to Genesis 1. This is fascinating. Here is Scripture using Scripture, right? <clears throat> and so when we get to Hebrews, we have Scripture using Scripture that was using Scripture. I'm not trying to play a word game with you. What I'm telling you is that the people in this, in, in, throughout the history of God's people those that God was truly using in his purpose to, uh, to, to accomplish it, they knew what the scripture said. And they didn't have nice leather-bound Bibles. Most of them didn't even have a scroll in their tent. They had to hear the word of God spoken, and they would hide it in their hearts so that they wouldn't sin against God. They didn't have nice Bibles. There was Out in the wilderness, uh, there was no a Jewish bookstore on the corner where you could go and get a scroll from Genesis to Malachi. Didn't happen. And yet they were God's covenant people and they had his word and they would take the promises, they would take the covenant seriously, at least at certain times. Oh my. So let, let, me, let me say quickly, an allusion is an indirect reference to something. All right? Again, it's not an illusion, something that looks like it's real and it isn't. This is an illusion. It's an indirect reference to something. Oh, Jim came running into the room uh, sounding like Paul Revere warning everybody. Right? There's no quote from Paul Revere in that. You're making an allusion to something that people know. And they get the idea when you say, well, he was acting like Paul Revere, just warning everybody. That's an allusion to something. It's not a quote. The Bible is filled with allusions to the early scriptures. Filled as well as direct quotes. Both of them are there. So let's consider the Genesis passage and we will be done for the day. God said, let us make man... In our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now listen carefully. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Are you hearing this? Adam was given the world then. And he lost it. That's what Psalm 8 tells us. You made him king over the works of your hands. And there's, then there's that sentence. But right now we don't see everything under his dominion. Why is that? Well, let's, let's listen. God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. For our purposes, we want to just consider the following three things quickly. Number one, God created mankind, male and female, in his own image. Every human being is an image bearer of God. Now, let me ask you, as you're driving down one of our streets or boulevards and you see the homeless lying there in the grass in the sun, does that look like someone who has dominion? Look at your own life. Look at some of the difficulties and challenges you face that you can't seem to handle or get rid of or deal with properly. Does it look like you have dominion over your life? 
How about the animals? Anybody here ready to say, God, I'm an image bearer of God. God gave me dominion over the animals. I'm climbing right up into this cage with this hungry lion. And I'm going to show them and everybody around me that I have dominion over the creatures. Do we have any takers? How about, oh, there's a pond over there with a big hungry gator. I'm going to swim in that, in that water with that alligator just to prove I have dominion. And most of us, at least when we're thinking well, aren't going to do that. But you see people doing things like that all the time. Look at extreme sports, if you've ever watched any of it. Sometimes I, I, I look and I think, this is astounding what they can ski up into the air and, and do all of these. They do virtual ballet and then land on their skis. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're defying death. They're defying gravity. They're trying to take dominion. When you see people doing crazy stuff that doesn't make any sense, what's driving them? What drove men to make the first airplane? They looked at the birds and they wanted to fly. They wanted to take dominion. It's built into every one of us at some level. And when we can't seem to conquer, when we can't get our world under control, oh, then we, we give it up to drug or to drink or immorality or all of these kinds of things. I can't get my dominion. When you see them in political fights, what are they doing? They want dominion. It's what we were created to do. But sin has hijacked it. You can see people everywhere around you, and you may even be one of them that's trying to prove you've got dominion somewhere over something or someone because you were made to do that. You were made to rule with Christ, but in this world, you just want to rule over somebody else or prove to everybody how wonderful you are. It's in us. So why don't we have dominion? The very word dominion means to rule, to control, to have power over. God delegated authority to mankind to take dominion, to subdue the earth, to rule over the creatures, and populate it with children, image bearers of God. Fill up the world. What is our world doing? Got too many people. Let's get rid of millions of them. That's not a mistake. They, are, they know what they're doing. We're going to make a better world by getting rid of a lot of you. Wicked souls, deceived souls. Humans were created to exercise dominion as God's vicegerents. Oh, what's a vicegerent? That's a word you find in the Puritans all the time. It's a person who exercises delegated power on behalf of a sovereign. You and I and all of God's people and in a sad way, every single image bearer of God is supposed to be a joint heir is supposed to be a vicegerent, dominion over the earth. When you look around, it's a mess, right? So why does Hebrews use this? He shows us that Jesus, the man, took dominion. By dying on Calvary's cross and rising again. That's why he's on the throne in glory, which is where Hebrews starts. Jesus is, uh, the writer to Hebrews, is taking us back into Jesus' life to show us why he's on that throne. He conquered, he did what his father called him to do. And I'll end with this. Do you know that king? Do you know Christ the king? I didn't ask you if you've got some Bible facts about him. That's important. But do you believe them? And do you walk in them? Because God has had mercy upon your soul. He's not cracking the whip. 
He's saying, I gave my life for yours. You can live with me. I've given you the, be the ability. Do you believe it? Walk in it. We have a king. And the amazing thing is we're going to rule with that king forever. And that's a good thing to remember when you're facing persecution, when you're facing difficulties, when you're facing trials and afflictions and sickness, heartaches and heartbreaks. We have a king, a conquering king, and the day is coming when we will rule with him as joint heirs for eternity. But he had to become a man to win that for us. That's what chapter 2 is about. And we will take up there next week, God willing. Oh, Christ in heaven, Christ in heaven, seated in splendor and glory. There are lost ones here today that do not know thee. Draw them out of their darkness. Draw them out of their darkness into the light of Christ. Oh, bring them out of slavery to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Bring them out from under Pharaoh, Satan, and bring them into the glorious kingdom that thou didst establish. And Father, for thy dear children, whatever their state, there may be some that are so joyful here today, they may be giddy. And there may be others, Lord, whose hearts are sunk and heavy and low. Lift them up. Lift them up. But come to the lost and make them realize that outside of thee, they are outside of the kingdom. Save them, Lord. Show them that thou art the crucified, resurrected Savior and save their souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? <clears throat> And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Amen. Let us go in the name of the Savior.